We are about to hear David Foster Wallace's thoughts on one of the greatest American presidents of all time, a president who ranks higher than presidents like Lincoln, FDR, and Teddy Roosevelt. Like, who are those guys? And you guys already know who I'm talking about. The undisputed go of presidents, Mr. George W. Bush. And I was a teenager in the Bush years, and I remember turning on the, the, the news every day and hearing his linguistical mastery. Did you guys hear how I kind of messed up my language right there? Bush would never do such a thing. And even better than his linguistical mastery on the pulpit, his knowledge of foreign affairs and his foreign affairs policy is going to go down as a massive net positive. So now we're going to hear David Foster Wallace talk about George Bush's linguistical ability. And if you guys don't already know, Right Conscious is the headquarters of everything related to David Foster Wallace. There is a massive playlist of more videos on Wallace down below. And if you are interested in further deep dives on Wallace, please do subscribe. And this is from an interview with Brian Gardner and Wallace is speaking, quote, but language is also a tool of persuasion. Propaganda, right? We have a president who apparently doesn't need to use the language well because as he's speaking, behind us are little banners. banners. Talk about Orwellian. Fighting the war on terrorism, right? Have you seen this? These press conferences? No longer do we need a president who's an example of an articulate, thoughtful person because we've got behind him this sort of almost hypnotic set of messages that someone has discovered that, with some base, those actually work better at creating a favorable impression than having a well-spoken, apparently thoughtful president. I don't mean to bust on the president. I'm just saying that in today's business and political climate, when you've got such specialization, you've got people who are so good at seeking to get what they want, whether those are votes or acquiescence or consumer behavior. There are uses of language that you and me are horrible and a debasement but are completely deliberate and, within the rules of that discipline, possibly effective, including save up to 50% or more. And this is Garner now speaking. Don't you think if President George W. Bush softened his dialect a bit, he could still speak as a Texan speaks? But if he were able, and he may not be able, to soften the dialect a bit, he could actually mitigate the credibility problem that he has with so many people all over the country. Back to Wallace. Well, I don't know about that. What interests me about Bush linguistically is he seems to me to be a walking very thin wire. Well, he's not walking a wire. What's the term? He's torn into two different directions, and I'm sure he's got people around him who are. On the one hand, his political viability is partly a matter of his being seen as like a man of the people. On the other hand, he's our number one bureaucrat and is required to speak official ease. And I don't think, even if you assume he's good at certain stuff, it's clear there's some kind of missing succulus or even some possible organic damage in his brain when it comes to being able to form complicated sentences, especially when they are like abstract nouns or weird conditional tenses that he's just not very good at it. Somewhere, someone has made the decision that having him spew up all these malpropisms, though it opens him up to ridicule to a certain percentage of well-educated people, who are probably not the people who are going to vote for him anyway, somehow has a positive effect for people in his base. Why that is, I don't know. I'm not privy to that theory. I'm not privy to the census data. But there are too many highly paid polit political pros around him for someone not to have suggested the idea that he become, you know, that he move closer to Will Rogers on the continuum and stop trying to use this official officialese that he's even worse than his father at, right? I mean, in a way, it's delicious because he, may, he so mangles it that it shows up officialese for what ugly BS it really is. But someone somewhere has decided... That in his political and governmental interest, that it is in his political and governmental interest to do this. And it's fascinating. Back to Gardner. Have you noticed how when he reads a speech, he sounds almost like a third grader saying the every time and a the nation and a nation, but not a nation or the nation the way almost every other American would? Back to Wallace. Yep. Part of what I know about him, I know from the Lemon article in The New Yorker, but he's apparently inter interpersonally one-on-one -on -one amazing, a Mozart. He's just very, very bad at public presentations of language, and I can only imagine what it must cost him to do it over and over again and over and over again. I don't have much sympathy for the guy politically, but you talk about someone who's looked from very early on in the campaign just out of his element linguistically, communicatively. What's fascinating and really scary is that this appears not to matter, or even to be a plus, right? And it's not that Carter with his nuclear nu nuclear, or Bill Clinton had a share of uh, solecisms too, 
But we are so far now from a Kennedy or a Woodrow Wilson or an FDR that it becomes tempting to think that our own instincts for what language you use means about the person, not just about the person's intelligence, but their character, their forthrightness are just, everything's different now. And people like you and me, we just don't have our finger on the, the pulse anymore. What people are looking for is not the kind of stuff we're talking about. You want to cut this out. I don't say that to my students because my line with them is still, look, you're at this elite school. You're going to end up in the professions, right? You need to quack this way. Forget all the stuff about it being beautiful and having centuries of tradition and being the adventure of a lifetime. But the truth is that between sophisticated advertising and national level politics, I'm at a loss as to what people's use of language is now meant to convey and connotate to the receiver. It's so different from the way I myself am wired that I just don't get it. I'm looking forward to starting this, starting to read stuff about it because someone's going to notice this. Okay, so there is a lot to unpack there. But first and foremost, the meritocracy in terms of American politics has gone has been away for a while. It is turned into populism. I don't care if you are in love with one of the two candidates who is going to be, or three, if, if you call, count RFK, who is going to be running in 2024. They are all linguistically not very smart. And even worse than that, they are not well-read and some could argue well advised in matters of psychology, philosophy, foreign affairs, you know, the deeper knowledge aspects of reality. And we've never really had a president who's been into those things because to rise to the top of America requires a certain persona and have certain institutions backing you. And people love to talk about how Donald Trump was this independent candidate, but he had been a New York, New York media uh, real estate mogul and really media mogul for decades before he ran for presidency and was connected to all those industries and to Epstein and to the Clintons and was it, he was a part of that world. And even on the local level, a candidate who is spewing highbrow, you know, intellectual stuff and talking about massive reform in whatever direction left or right is usually looked at suspiciously because the the populace isn't educated enough to understand them. And so you have um, candidates now who are using officialese, using bud, buzzwords and dumbing themselves down even at times. People like um, Vivek Ramaswamy or whatever his name was, you could tell when he was talking that he was pulling himself back and trying to appeal to a certain base of, of the Republican Party, that if he wanted to go off and be more intellectual, he obviously could have. But when you look at like his, I don't even, I read him one time, like his 10 mottos for his campaign or whatever, they were very basic because that's what the average person needs. They don't need uh, a, a response to Deleuze's anti-Oedipus. They need to know that you either support or don't support trans people or whatever other issue. And so now we're once again stuck with the lesser of two evils. And should you vote for either? No, because that's like asking to drink. If I said to you, hey, drink, do you want Coke or Dr. Pepper? Both suck, but we're not, we're not going to get lost in the weeds here. And so George Bush, as I'm sure a lot of you guys know, was a master of the gaffe. And looking back in retrospect, um, compared to Obama, he absolutely sucked at speaking. And compared to Trump, I would say he was much worse on the mic. And what's the scariest of all, and now we're getting a little bit political, that he, George Bush, let me let me hear, hear down in the comments right now. Who, let's not talk about policy. Let's abandon all, all policy, what your opinions are about what they are saying. Who is a better speaker, Joe Biden or George W. Bush? I think Biden, when he's at his best, sounds much more um, educated and formal, but he has, you know, in recent times, a, a very high ability to gaff or to go off topic or say something random. But George Bush back in the day kind of had this authenticity to him, and that's what they're kind of saying here. But he had this, he was combining authentic, uh, authenticity with legal uh, officialese and uh, direct knowledge of the war on terror. And I think Wallace makes a great point that he was torn because obviously you want to be taken seriously and you want to use the officialese language because that's just a part of the job. But then we have the actual reality of his base. And that's the same today with, you know, as we're starting to get more polarized and the war on terror really started that shockwave of polarization is that you need to speak to your base. But when you're at that 50,000 feet above level as a president where you have to speak to an entire country or, you know, an uh, entire battleground states, you know, one being you might be talking to, you know, people in Michigan and in Arizona, then you have to have this wide message. Because if you're running for governor in a Florida, for instance, you can evoke the Floridian dialect. And that's how the Bushes did well in Texas, because <laughs> they're 
somewhat of an embodiment of the Texas ideal. You know, these uber successful men that went to an Ivy League school, but at the same time aren't like too highfalutin. And another great point I I saw them bring up is the kind of the integration of mantras because, you know, fighting the war on terrorism was a big thing and all the banners and stuff because we kind of saw Obama pick that up with the whole hope thing and using media and then social media to kind of push messages and obviously Trump with um, make America great again and Biden's trying it like every campaign needs a motto, but they are pushing it a lot more now. And maybe I'm wrong because I'm only in my 30s and haven't wasn't necessarily present for Ronald Reagan's campaign and everyone else's campaigns. But I hear it from people on both sides, like uh, the typical beer drinker or person who just accepts um, Joe Biden or Donald Trump. They'll tell me that we're building back better or we're keeping America great or we're going to make America great again. And they'll just tell me that. And it's almost like I'm supposed to assume that that means something. I'm here at the level of, does America even exist? Is it moral to even tax the one to build back better? Like, I'm, I'm over here contemplating those ideas, but 99% of voters are not. And I don't know if it's, you know, Bush was successful because we all want to see people having gaffes themselves, like not being perfect. And that was somewhat of the appeal of Trump's presidency was that he wasn't perfect, that he was he kind of embodied some irrational part of our soul that sometimes when people are trolling you, you just want to get on Twitter and like hit him back. And this is something I've noticed a lot on BookTube because the most popular BookTubers by far are the guys that get really close to the camera like Benjamin McVoy and don't polarize at all. Today, we are going to be hearing about David Foster Wallace's thoughts on George Bush and like all the guys that do that and they talk slow and they, you know, have the muted environment in the back and never rock the boat. They do much better. And that's because others can see themselves in that. There's this ideal of the typical reader of the, of how the person looks who got the PhD or should be representing the community looks. And then when you hear me and I'm rocking the boat and talking about the Anunnaki and stuff, they're like, wait, I don't resonate with that. That's not, that's not this perfect image. And so when you look at the common voter, the typical American who voted for George W. Bush and uh, my family all up in Utah, I have family in Utah who are um, blue collar workers. And I don't think any of them have ever read a book outside of the Bible in their entire life. And when you talk to them about Bush, I would talk to them about back in the day and kind of ask about the stuff. And they're like, yeah, that's, you know, that's a problem, but he, it's fine. Like he's fighting against terrorism and it was these propagandas and these slogans and they're still used today. Like this really, I don't vote. I don't, I've never voted, never will vote. And so this, these are just tactics that are being used and ideas that both sides of the political spectrum are implementing now. And so what are your thoughts on this? What do you guys remember about George W. Bush's linguistical ability? And I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.